Good evening. It's a real privilege to be here, and uh, let's just dive in. We've got a lot of material to cover. So um, I, thought, I thought I'd start with sharing uh, a couple views from Silicon Valley, where I, I lived for 10 years before I moved to the UK uh, about seven and a half years ago. Um, Jack Dorsey, the founder of Twitter, uh, CEO of Square, was recently in the news declaring that he thinks Bitcoin will eventually be the single global currency in about 10 years' time. Uh, earlier, Tim Draper, uh, a billionaire venture capitalist, said that if you try to use the pound, the euro, the dollar in about five years, people will laugh at you. So those are a couple views from Silicon Valley. I wouldn't say those are the consensus views of Silicon Valley, but, but anyway, that's just to give you a sense of what some people are thinking where this space could go. Um, I thought I would start there to kind of wake people up a bit. Um, in terms of blockchain, there's a similar amount of kind of uh, hype, I would say, uh, and declarations. The blockchain will do to banks and law firms, uh, in an HBR article, uh, what the internet did to media. This was written by some friends of mine at, at MIT, uh, who later, uh, uh, the headline was changed, the blockchain will do to the financial system, um, what uh, the internet did to media. I think my, my friends at the Digital Currency Initiative may have called up HBR and said, you know, we have a couple law firms and banks who fund our research. Do you mind just softening <laughs> that, that headline a bit there? Um, but anyway, the point is there's a lot of hype, a lot of pretty, pretty provocative claims about what Bitcoin, what cryptocurrency, what blockchain is going to do to transform our world. So tonight, let's uh, dig into uh, this topic um, with the following kind of things we're going to cover. First, what, who invented blockchain? And what hard problem in computer science did that solve? Let's, let's start with the, the core innovation here. We'll then get into this question of whether cryptocurrency can ever become widely used money, and, and how does blockchain technology work? All right, we'll, we'll take a little bit of a, a look under the bonnet. Uh, we don't have a lot of time, but we'll try to give you a little sense of, of how this works mechanically. Uh, get into some of the research I've done on empirical data and, and kind of measure that against the hype around this, this subject look at the broader applications of the technology, and then we'll spend some time at the end trying to look ahead with where things could go uh, in the future. Okay, so first, who invented blockchain technology and what hard problem did it solve? So the story of cryptocurrency and blockchain really begins with the cypherpunks. Uh, this is a group of computer scientists, uh, primarily libertarian in their political orientation, who in the 80s and 90s, mostly based in the Bay Area, uh, got together on listservs online and started working on privacy-enhancing technology. So this is technology like PGP, pretty good privacy, that ensures that emails sent from one party to another remain confidential and, and are protected from, say, an outside observer uh, knowing the contents of, of those emails. Some of the people in this community were also interested in financial privacy. And so David Chom, who's pictured here, uh, really wrote the, the first, um, I think, paper uh, on, on electronic uh, anonymous cash in 1983. So the story of cryptocurrency really begins many decades ago. And in fact, if you read a Wired magazine article on Chom's subsequent commercialization of digital cash uh, called DigiCash in the late 90s, if you were to substitute the word Bitcoin for the word DigiCash, uh, it would very much read like an article today about Bitcoin. So the idea is around anonymous digital money uh, have been with us for many, many decades. In fact, many of the technologies, all the technologies that went into creating Bitcoin and blockchain in 2008 existed over 10 years before uh, Satoshi Nakamoto uh, wrote his now famous uh, white paper. So what hard problem did Satoshi Nakamoto solve? <coughs> Excuse me. In uh, the lead up to the publication of the Bitcoin white paper in 2008, there was this very difficult computer science challenge that goes by the name double spending problem. And what this basically means is that it was very difficult, impossible to create a decentralized way to create scar a scarce digital token or a scarce digital file. Okay? So if you're familiar with um, you know, uh, the Pirate Bay and the, the BitTorrent protocol, you know it's very easy to copy files and share them online. And that's a real problem if you're trying to create something that is a store of value that's scarce, right? So what Satoshi Nakamoto, in essence, did is created a way to uh, have scarcity uh, on the internet. 
All right, once you can make something scarce, it can have value. But if it's not scarce, it can't have value, right? So Satoshi published this paper in 2008 describing how a distributed timestamp ledger, which we now call the blockchain, is the key to creating decentralized scarcity on the internet. All right, and that's really the core innovation. And we'll dig into more how that works uh, a little bit later. But first, let's just briefly compare Satoshi's invention, Bitcoin, with our traditional financial system. So traditionally, we're used to thinking about assets like currency, stocks, and bonds as something that is, is separate and distinct from the ledgers and networks on which they are transferred and traded. Um, with Bitcoin, the asset and the network are fully integrated. Okay, they're locked together. You cannot separate Bitcoin from its blockchain. All right, it is a fully integrated system. I can take my currency and I can trade it on the New York Stock Exchange or I can take it to Hong Kong and trade it there. I can transfer it across Visa, Swift, and so on. With Bitcoin, there's one place it can travel and one place it lives, and that's on its blockchain. All right, and that integration uh, creates some really powerful features and capabilities. It makes it pro more, easily to pro more easy to program uh, Bitcoin uh, and integrate uh, things like smart contracts, which we'll talk about a little bit later. All right, so that's kind of a key difference. So you can kind of think of the assets as like the train car, right? And the networks and exchanges is like the rails. And you can pick this up and put this on a different set of rails, right? So is that, hopefully that's, that's clear there. Okay, so that's a brief introduction to Bitcoin and blockchain. Now we're gonna actually take a detour and talk about money. Um, because if you don't understand money, you'll never understand Bitcoin. Um, so, and this will help us answer this question of can cryptocurrency ever become a widely used form of, of money? So first, where does money come from? No longer trees, right? Because we're moving to plastic money. Um, so, you know, in the many years I've been lecturing now on cryptocurrency and blockchain, um, I've been really, it's been a real eye opener to see how many people actually do not know the answer to this question. I think many people understand that the money in our pockets, the banknotes, the coins, those are minted by central banks, by mints. But what they don't know is that that represents less than, on average, 5% of the money in circulation. All right, the notes, and token, the notes and coins in our pockets, that's around 5%. So where does the other 95% of our money come from? This is not something that's widely taught. Uh, it's not that people don't know this because they're uh, ignorant or, or they're, you know, you know it, it's just not something that's even taught in Economics 101 oftentimes, that the vast majority of our money is actually produced by banks through the process of making loans. So private commercial banks lend money into existence. That's how most of our money becomes created. And the interesting kind of point here uh, with regards to Bitcoin is that Bitcoin is also privately created money. Now there's big differences between the money that commercial banks create and of course Bitcoin. Commercial banks are much more tightly regulated but there is this commonality in terms of the fact that both are privately, uh, private institutions in essence, All right? So, is Bitcoin money? This is a question that comes up a lot. Well, we can think of money uh, as having three functions, uh, you know, medium of exchange, a store of value, and a unit of account, but these three functions are not all equal. They can be kind of viewed hierarchically. There are many, many things that serve as a store of value, right? So our houses, uh, pieces of art, these all can be stores of value. Fewer things uh, are mediums, mediums of exchange, which allow us to get past, say, barter trading of horses for cows and the inconvenience of that. You can use sometimes, although I don't know how popular this will be going forward, uh, social media like buttons on Facebook uh, to, say, uh, earn a toaster in a contest that ran in Germany recently. Um, so other things besides currency can be a medium of exchange, right? But the most exclusive uh, feature of money is its unit of account function. And in most countries, there is one unit of account. There is one uh, currency in which goods and services are priced in. Uh, and in the UK, of course, that's the pound. In the US, it's the dollar. And when we think about, is Bitcoin a store of value? Yes, it's been storing some value in a volatile way for eight plus years now. Uh, is it a medium exchange? Can you use it to buy things? Yes. Uh, there's even a pub in Cambridge where I live where you can actually go in and buy 
a Sunday roast like I did with Bitcoin. But is it a unit of account? And, and here is where I think Bitcoin kind of falls down. That Sunday roast, uh, the, the nominal amount of Bitcoin I have to pay uh, for that Sunday roast will actually fluctuate in real time with, this exchange, with Bitcoin's exchange rate against the pound. So even though the roast is priced in Bitcoin, the true unit of account is actually the pound. In other words, if Bitcoin's price drops 50%, uh, the next week when I go back, I'm going to have to pony up twice as much units of Bitcoin to actually purchase that, 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 that Sunday roast, right? So basically, the answer to this question is, in my view, Bitcoin really does not represent money. It's more of a currency. It's more of an asset. But it's not meeting that definition of money. So why does Bitcoin even exist? Why do alternative currencies exist? That's what I think of Bitcoin as, is alternative currency. Uh, the research I've done on the history of alternative currencies, which we'll also come back to at the end when we ask this question of what's going to happen with Bitcoin, uh, shows that there's really five forces that drive the existence of alternative currencies. They often uh, come into existence during uh, periods of economic stress. So in the Great Depression, the 1930s, we saw a very wide proliferation of alternative currencies. Hundreds were created by towns that had lots of unemployed people and work to do but no money to pay, so they actually created their own currencies. Banking crises, other things often lead to the creation of, of alternative currencies. Uh, financial inefficiencies uh, also are found as a reason for why alternative currencies come into existence, very high fees, uh, financial repression, uh, restrictions on owning certain types of assets. Um, politics uh, in London, next door to where I used to live, uh, Brixton has a famous alternative currency called the Brixton Pound that was created as a response to globalization, desire to keep uh, commerce local, so uh, you know, too big to fail, uh, concerns around privacy, uh, you know, with Bitcoin, these are some of the political motivations that often give rise to, to uh, alternative currencies. Advances in technology, Bitcoin's an obvious example here, but also with the Brixton Pound, <clears throat> it's not just a paper currency, uh, there's actually a pay by text uh, capability. And, and the fact that uh, a currency as small as the Brixton Pound has access to that type of technology, I think, is, is quite, uh, quite, quite interesting. And then last, these alternative currencies don't. Um, come into existence on their own, there's people that actually get together and create them. So some kind of entrepreneurial motivation, uh, you know, and so on, profit motive is often another factor we see driving these into existence. So those are why alternative currencies come into existence. So, okay, that was a brief detour into money and alternative currency. Now let's come back to the technology and how Bitcoin and blockchain actually work. <clears throat> and this is the part where I wish I had three hours uh, to, go, to go into depth on things like elliptic curve, digital, digital signature algorithms, and one-way mathematical trapdoors, and so on, right? But we're going to try to keep this at a pretty high level. Um, <clears throat> so the first problem that we run into when we're trying to explain how the technology works is, is this. Uh, this is an image that often accompanies many news articles and stories uh, in, in you know, the newspaper, on television, uh, about Bitcoin and blockchain. But this image has an obvious problem, which is that it's showing a physical object, whereas Bitcoin is electronic. Blockchain is electronic, right? So people who already don't understand how money works, by and large, are, are asked to now try to understand how Bitcoin works and shown this image, right? So uh, that, that creates a, a problem. A better image to keep in your mind's eye as you're kind of thinking about how the technology works is this one. So Bitcoin and blockchain are really a series of connected computers uh, maintaining a shared database and talking with each other to achieve a consensus, basically, about the state of the database, who owns what, right? That's what, what Bitcoin really kind of looks like. Uh, and, and I wish the media would use this image more. Um, how does it actually work? Well, it works a lot like email. With email, you have an email address, and you have a password, which gives you access to your email account. Right? With Bitcoin, you have a Bitcoin address, and you have what's called a private key, which is basically a password that gives you the ability to spend those Bitcoins. Right? So there's some similarities there. It gets you know, more complicated after that fact. But the point is, if anyone gets your email password, they can, of course, get into your account and send emails from your email account. Just like if anyone gets your Bitcoin private key, they can spend your Bitcoins, right? So similar in that way. Um, 
In terms of how the blockchain actually works, this is a highly simplified uh, depiction here, but imagine I want to send uh, a Bitcoin to Nick. Um, I initiate a transaction here, and, and before he receives that Bitcoin, it has to go through a gate. It has to be verified by those computers that we showed you a picture of earlier that are checking to make sure that I actually have the Bitcoin I'm trying to send to Nick, and that I'm not simultaneously trying to send the same Bitcoin to my mother, that I'm not trying to double spend that same Bitcoin. And so after those computers have checked to verify that my transaction is legitimate, they allow that transaction to be added to the blockchain. What is the blockchain? Well, each uh, block in, in this chain of transactions is simply a bundle of transactions. It's my transaction al along with roughly a few thousand other transactions that are bundled together and appended to the end of the chain and connected cryptographically to the previous block of transactions, which in turn is connected to the earlier block of transactions, which goes all the way back to the 3rd of January 2009 when Satoshi Nakamoto first started running Bitcoin software. All right, so it's just basically a complete history of all the transactions that have ever occurred since early 2009. And roughly that file, that database, is 150 to 200 gigabytes in size today. It's growing, right? It continues to grow as more transactions are added. But that's basically what the blockchain is. It's a history. Okay. So these computers that are running the network, where do they exist? Well, in our global benchmarking study, we put together the first map of where miners are, are based. And we this is not a surprise. We found a lot of them based in China, but also in places like Canada, the US, Iceland, Poland, Sweden, uh, places that are cold, have cheap electricity, and other features. Uh, we actually have province level data in China. And you can see that Sichuan province in the center there is actually the most popular place to run Bitcoin computing equipment. And why? Well, it's uh, got very cheap electricity. That's the most important ingredient in being a profitable Bitcoin miner. Uh, there's, uh, uh, it's a mountainous region, so it's colder than other parts of, of, of China and the rest of the world. And you have to spend less money on cooling your equipment. Uh, there's a reliable enough internet connection. And there's low population density. Um, these facilities, these Bitcoin mines, this is one in Mongolia, actually get really loud. And so the fewer neighbors you have, uh, the fewer noise complaints you get. Um, there's some other ingredients now to successful Bitcoin mines. Bitcoins become really valuable. Uh, some of this equipment gets stolen. There were some 600 machines that were stolen in Iceland recently, and so you've got to invest in security and, and, and cameras and things like that. So uh, the safer the, the, the surroundings, probably the, the less money you have to spend on security. But those are the keys to kind of successful, profitable Bitcoin mining. So that was our brief detour into kind of how the technology works. There's a lot more we could say uh, about this, but we have to kind of keep moving. So let's talk about some of the hype versus some of the empirical data we've collected. So you have venture capitalists and, and tech entrepreneurs like Mark Andreessen comparing the disruptive potential of cryptocurrency and blockchain to the internet and before it, the PC computer. They think it's on that level. Why? Well, if you look at the world before the internet, if you wanted to send information, or if you wanted to, say, deploy some kind of telecommunications application, you had to go through the phone company. Okay, the phone company acts as a gatekeeper, right? After the internet and the invention of protocols like TCP, IP, and so on, anyone could develop an application, set up a website without anyone else's permission. All right, it opened up uh, the possibility for innovation and enabled you know, world-beating companies like Amazon, Cisco, Google, et cetera, to become what they are today, right? The world before Bitcoin looks similar. If you want to send value from one party to another, if you want to develop a FinTech application, you need the permission of a bank to deploy that, all right? But with you know, the Bitcoin protocol and then other subsequent cryptocurrency protocols, anyone who wants to transfer value from one person to another can do that now. Anyone who wants to build a FinTech application can write the code and deploy it on a blockchain without anyone's permission. All right, so it opens things up in a similar way, right? Is 
Bitcoin a bubble, right? This is the price chart. It's been crashing of late, right? Um, this question comes up a lot, and it's a really simplistic question, right? Um, so the recent price correction, where Bitcoin hit $20,000 in December and lost about 70% of its value, um, uh, and this chart is slightly out of date, my apologies. Um, that's only like the sixth biggest correction in Bitcoin's history, right? On two other occasions, it's actually corrected over 90%, and two other occasions over 80%, right? So it keeps crashing, and it keeps coming back. You know, this is an article in Wired Magazine from uh, November 2011, in essence declaring the death of Bitcoin, right? After the great crash from $30 down to $1 or whatever it was. Um, that's about when that Wired Magazine article appeared. Right? You can't even see that anymore, right? So if it is a bubble, you know, it's behaving in kind of a, a strange way, right? Like tulips went up and went down and kind of stayed down. You know, this is kind of more like Amazon. You know, Amazon, Amazon stock price in 1999, 2000 crashed like everything else and has come back, you know, even higher. That's kind of what Bitcoin's price has done. We'll see if that keeps happening. Um, we published the global cryptocurrency benchmarking study about a year ago. Some of the data uh, from that study, including I think the main contribution of the study, was, is, is reflected in this chart here, which is kind of the first rigorous uh, estimate of how many people actually are using cryptocurrency. And so what we estimated was uh, a year ago roughly five to 10 million unique active users of cryptocurrency around the world today. Um, today, my back of the envelope calculation is roughly about 15 to 30 million. So it's growing, but it's still not a huge number. You know, not anywhere close to, you know, uh, Facebook's two, two billion, right? A um, lot of money has been pouring into the space. In fact, the amount of money going into what's, what are called initial coin offerings now dwarfs the amount of money that's been invested by venture capitalists into companies. And what's driving that? There's a lot more to this cryptocurrency and blockchain story than just Bitcoin and even currency. Um, and I would just highlight one example here, uh, a company called Blockstack um, and an uh, entrepreneur named Munib Ali are really working on trying to rebuild the internet uh, on the backbone of blockchain technology and make it more decentralized and, and better in their view. And there's this interesting quote that Muni, Muni made about how blockchain can help us advance from a world of don't be evil to a world of can't be evil. All right, Google's motto famously is don't be evil. Uh, Munib's criticism of, of that world is we shouldn't be in a world where Google even can be evil. They shouldn't have that much power. They shouldn't have a choice. Let's use this blockchain technology to, in essence, bind our hands and lock us into a system where <laughs> transparency and auditability and accountability and, and you know, the prevention of fraud are all kind of baked into the rules of the system, right? around decentralized storage and, and all these applications that go way beyond currency, right? So let's talk about some of those broader applications of blockchain technology. Blockchain uh, can be thought of as a database, right? A type of distributed, replicated database. It kind of sits within this family of distributed databases, right? But if we abstract away from the technology for a second and think about what is blockchain really doing uh, it's, in essence, creating a new way for us to cooperate and achieve trust. You can think of it as a digital handshake, all right? And there's lots of problems with this approach to trust and cooperation. Handshakes can be easily broken, right? But code can bind us in a way that this can't, you know? If this gets broken, we've got to go to the courts. If we can even do that, maybe there's a better way. Maybe there's a way to actually use a system that simply prevents some of the bad activities uh, that this, this can sometimes enable or facilitate, right? So what all can blockchain do besides currency? Uh, the economist Hernando de Soto has done a lot of work on, on um, you know, uh, dead capital, the 10 trillion estimated, uh, you know, in, in capital that, that it, you know, people don't have property title to in places like uh, you know, Lima, Peru and other places. You could use blockchain as a, as a, a, a title, property title database. And in fact, Sweden 
the Republic of Georgia, Ukraine are all working on this uh, as a way to actually give people title to land or improve upon our current systems for actually managing property title. You can also think about blockchain uh, in elections. So right now when you cast a vote in an election, uh, there's no way for you to know, I think in most countries, whether or not your vote was counted, right? It's a complete act of faith. Uh, does that deter people from voting? I don't know. But you can imagine, you could take, you can imagine using a blockchain to have a unique uh, alphanumeric ID uh, that only you know, uh, so you, re you remain anonymous, uh, to cast your vote, but then to be able to check an online ledger uh, after the fact to see, oh, there's my ID, there's my vote in the column where it should be, and I see that it sums to the result, right? So these are just some of the broader use cases of the technology. Um, and there's a lot of companies and large organizations working on using blockchain. Here in the UK, uh, the Royal Mint uh, has launched uh, Digital Gold in partnership with CME. Uh, uh, the Australian Stock Exchange is looking at, to move to a blockchain-based kind of exchange platform. Um, but most of these big initi initiatives uh, are still in kind of the proof of concept phase or just being talked about. They haven't actually been widely deployed yet. And why is that? Well, in our follow-on study to the cryptocurrency benchmarking study, we published in September the global blockchain benchmarking study. And we looked into, you know, what's really, um, you know, leading to all these delays in the rollout of blockchain and distributed ledger technology. And what we found is, is there's a lot of concern around the legal and regulatory environment for, for releasing blockchain uh, solutions, Un uh, unclear you know, legal landscape and, and how blockchains will be, um, you know, used in, 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 with regards to the law. There's issues around the privacy uh, of blockchains, the fact they actually may leak too much information. Um, and, and in fact, there's quite a bit of work being done to address this privacy challenge. Um, and interestingly, uh, the solutions around trying to create more private blockchains, so there's greater privacy for customer data and so on, uh, are mostly exploring technologies that are used by cryptocurrencies. So things like zero knowledge proofs, which is used by uh, Zcash, and ring signatures, which is used by Monero, are the two most common privacy enhancing blockchain technologies that enterprises are looking at. So the reason why this is important is the world of blockchain is not separate from the world of cryptocurrency, right? The technology you know, is kind of going back and forth between the two and what's happening in one may influence the other. Central banks are looking at blockchain technology. Um, we found that a significant number of them are actually testing the technology, and in fact, 60%, nearly 60% of them, are using some version of the Ethereum code base to test and play with. Again, that's a public blockchain technology. Um, so again, as I mentioned, it's pretty early days in terms of how blockchain is gonna be deployed in the enterprise and the public sector. But there's a lot of questions around, well, which sectors of the economy are gonna be most disrupted and impacted? And so we actually counted the number of use cases, uh, over 130 distinct use cases of blockchain technology. And what we did is we looked at what sectors of the economy uh, those use cases fall into. And we found that banking and finance is where 30% of the use cases fall. Government represents 13%, insurance 12%, healthcare 8%. This is a crude kind of approximation of where uh, interest is, uh, because think about Bitcoin, it's a financial instrument, it was more obvious to the banking and finance industry to probably start taking a, taking a look at blockchain technology given Bitcoin as a currency than say healthcare, right? So there may be a bit of a delay, maybe healthcare will be actually a sector that uh, you know, we see even more impact than, than finance potentially, right? But that's one measure. Another measure we can look at to try to get some sense of where the greatest impact in the economy will be is the public cryptocurrency markets. How many of those tokens, top 100 tokens, are healthcare tokens, you know, or are insurance tokens, and so on? And we find that again, in terms of the market value, 70% of the top 100 tokens are banking and finance uh, tokens, and nearly 50% of the number of tokens are banking and finance, followed by uh, technology services, and then meeting and t entertainment. So. The, the data we do have does seem to indicate that banking and finance is the sector that's most uh, you know, up for disruption by this technology. 
So briefly, let's touch on smart contracts, considered by many to be the killer app of blockchain technology. What is a smart contract? So uh, if you own a dog, uh, you probably trust your dog walker, or if you have a dog walker, uh, but imagine you don't. You don't trust your dog walker. So you attach a GPS collar to your dog, and when the dog goes out for a walk uh, and then comes back to your house, the collar syncs with the Wi-Fi network, uploads the map and the uh, number of miles uh, walked to the Ethereum blockchain smart contract that checks to see that, yes, the five kilometers that you agreed with your dog walker for Fido to walk have been walked, and then initiates a payment to the dog walker automatically. So that's, in essence, what a smart con contract can do. I don't necessarily recommend that you go running out to start this business. Uh, I'm not sure that this is a, a, a real winner, but um, you know, companies like HSBC are looking at how to integrate smart contracts into trade finance and shipping, right? Much bigger value proposition could speed up um, payment uh, of bills, free up capital, and so on. That's, that's a, probably a more lucrative uh, proposition. Um, but there are some challenges to smart contracts being introduced more widely. And I think the UK uh, flight insurance market is an interesting example here. In a 12-month period, there were 600,000 people who were eligible to collect flight insurance because their flight was either delayed or canceled and did not do so. 600,000 people were owed money and did not collect that money. Why? Maybe they forgot they had, they had the flight insurance. Maybe the process for collecting it was too bureaucratic. The point is, is that you could easily imagine a smart contract querying a public flight database, because when a flight's canceled or delayed, that's a, public, that's a public record, and then automatically paying the insured party the, the money owed, right? Sounds great, right? This seems like a no-brainer. Uh, doesn't that sound wonderful? No more claims and bureaucratic process. Why hasn't this been released? Well, the insurance companies obviously would lose you know, a lot of money, right, if they started paying these 600,000 people. Um, so there is you know, one company that started trialing this just recently. I've been banging on about this example for years now. One company did start trialing this recently because I think there is a recognition that something like this is inevitable, right? It makes sense. It makes sense it's inevitable. It's only a question of whether an incumbent is going to cannibalize their own profits uh, and introduce this product or a startup's going to come in and take market share from the existing incumbents, right? But that's kind of how a smart contract could could, could work with, with flight insurance, with life insurance too, right? Another binary uh, you know, situation. You're either alive or you're dead. Oftentimes that information is on a public database you know, and so on. So insurance is an interesting area where smart contracts could play a role. Okay, so wrapping up, um, and I'm running over here. Uh, so where is all this going? So Bitcoin sits at this really complex three-way intersection between economics, technology, and policy. And these things are constantly shift, shifting and evolving, right? So it's very hard to forecast kind of where this is all going to go. But we can kind of think about Bitcoin from two perspectives, you know, as a store of value, as an asset, like gold, and also as a currency and payment system, right? And this use case as, a, as an asset is actually more established to date, right? It's, it's actually... Um, you know, we've got regulated futures markets in the U.S. with CME and CBOE now, right? But what about this role as a currency, you know, and as a, as a payment system? That's, that's kind of more radical, potentially, uh, in terms of a use case. Well, we can turn to the history of alternative currencies, um, and, and we see that the vast majority of alternative currencies have died relatively quick deaths throughout history, all right? Um, why have they, have they died? Uh, well, typically not by regulation. That's the one that most Bitcoiners are worried about. But very few currencies, the Austrian Freegeld is the exception in the 1930s, which was killed by the Central Bank of Austria, actually died due to regulation. Will Bitcoin be you know, killed due to regulation because it's used in cyber crime? Uh, you know, maybe, maybe not. Uh, you know, tools uh, that allow us to graph transactions and actually track criminals on the Bitcoin blockchain are becoming more advanced. And law enforcement authorities, authorities have actually had a lot of success um, you know, capturing the wallet software of criminals. And, and that's like getting a hold of the books, the digital books of a criminal, uh, which if the criminal was using cash, you wouldn't have. And furthermore, 
we've seen big uh, asset seizures. I think Bulgaria is sitting on like three billion in Bitcoin or like 10% of their, their national debt, right, that they were able to reclaim from this criminal gang. So, so law enforcement's getting more comfortable with, with Bitcoin. And so, you know, we're not sure if regulators will try to squash it for those reasons, right? But the main cause of death for alternative currencies throughout history is simply lack of adoption, lack of demand. Uh, that's what kills alternative currencies. Pe people stop using them. Um, and why would someone stop using Bitcoin? Well, let's quickly go through some of the reasons. It's too complicated. This is a chart that was put together to explain how Bitcoin works, right? Try showing this to your mother or grandmother <laughs> and getting them comfortable with this. They're okay with email and not knowing what the SMTP protocol is. But when it comes to their money, they might be a little more conservative, right? Um, you know, one of my new favorite reasons for why people may not want to use Bitcoin is not everyone wants to be their own bank. Uh, in Oxfordshire, for example, there was, you may know, a family that was held up at gunpoint um, uh, by four armed men to transfer Bitcoins to, uh, to the criminal group, right? A uh, Ukrainian man was kidnapped and had to pay a million dollar ransom, right? So when you've got anonymous digital currency, uh, that's a real nice target for, for criminals. There's a lot of competition. Uh, there's over 1,500 cryptocurrencies now today. Some of them offer greater privacy than, than Bitcoin, like Zcash. Um, and, and these privacy-focused cryptocurrencies are actually taking market share from Bitcoin on the dark web, right? So internal competition could prevent kind of the critical mass necessary needed, necessary to get a lot of people using, say, any one of these cryptocurrencies. Uh, there's the environmental concerns, uh, you know, concern about how much energy Bitcoin is consuming. Uh, there's the strategy miscalculation. A paper I did suggested that uh, the places that would have the, you know, the greatest utility for something like Bitcoin uh, are in sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, and the former Soviet countries. Yet if you look at a heat map of where Bitcoin uh, businesses are based, accepting businesses, where Bitcoin venture capital is primarily gone, it's mostly gone to North America, Western Europe, Asia, in other words, the places that are, you know, uh, where Bitcoin would have the uh, lower utility value. Um, you know, there's a social movement behind cryptocurrency as well, and what we found, of course, is that these social movements like Occupy Wall Street can lose momentum. You know, if there was a multi, multi-year, you know, five-year kind of uh, bear market for cryptocurrency, would people lose interest? Um, there's governance challenges, right? Who's leading these projects? Um, there's the risk of quantum computing, right, and, and cracking uh, public-private key crypt cryptography. Can we continue? to, uh, you know, once quantum computing comes around, uh, you know, create quantum resistant uh, cryptography that outpaces advances in quantum computing, right? That's an open question. But the big, I think, problem, and there's a lot of other issues, right, for why people won't use cryptocurrency as a currency, uh, is the fact that people aren't paid in Bitcoin. You know, we're used to going and looking for new investments, um, but with our spending cash, that's what we get paid in. That's what we use. And most people aren't paid in Bitcoin. And until they are, I would argue it's going to have a hard time becoming a widely used currency. Right? It may be an asset like digital gold, but as a currency, it's going to struggle until it gets over this hurdle. And if you're going to pay people in cryptocurrency, you also need to know what it's worth. And economists like Robert Schiller and others, I think, correctly have argued it's very difficult to know what Bitcoin should be worth. Right? There's a lot of uncertainty around its future. Uh, it makes it difficult to, uh, to uh, price. So that's the bear case for cryptocurrency. Let's finish on a positive note. What's the, the bullish case? Well, not all alternative currencies die quick deaths. The merchant tokens used here in the UK by the butchers, the bakers, and the candlestick makers to solve this big problem of small change actually were circulated for hundreds of years, right? Because they solved an econo economic problem, the lack of pennies and half pennies. So what economic problems could Bitcoin solve? We already talked about its use as digital gold. Why would someone want to use something like Bitcoin as digital gold? The reoccurrence of financial crises, as Hyman Minsky and other economists, I think, have argued, you know, we're going to continue to see financial crises, and people may want an asset that's disconnected from the banking system and from currencies, right? So Bitcoin could offer that. Uh, there's a lot of political upheaval in places like Spain and elsewhere. We see interest in cryptocurrencies rising uh, when there's political chaos. There's geopolitical tensions that also drive interest in cryptocurrency. Uh, it's been interesting that over the last 18 months as tensions on the, uh, the Korean Peninsula rose, uh, cryptocurrency investment in South Korea, Japan, and other countries nearby skyrocketed. You know, correlation is not causation, right? But you know, the prices also plummeted as it seems like tensions have coming, are coming down. 
uh, interesting, interesting there to observe that. So that's kind of the digital gold kind of case. But what about the currency? You know, the use of Bitcoin or something like it as a currency, what could drive broader interest in that? Um, the death of cash, you know, eventually I think cash is going to go away. It's effectively gone away in places like Sweden already. If people's attitudes towards privacy change, we may start to see people turning to privacy enhancing cryptocurrencies, right? If cash doesn't exist anymore. That's not the world we live in today. People don't seem to care too much about privacy, uh, but that could shift. There's stable coins. Uh, I actually helped create one of these um, called AAA. These are cryptocurrencies that are designed to not be volatile, all right? So yet have the same you know, programmability of a cryptocurrency. This is something that you may feel better about spending. It doesn't feel good to spend Bitcoin if you think the price is going up, but if we can actually successfully develop a stable cryptocurrency, this could drive interest in, in the use as a currency. And then last, really I think the, the, the main thing that could uh, propel cryptocurrency is this use uh, in the Internet of Things and amongst machines, in machine-to-machine in -machine transactions, right? So machines are already getting paid in cryptocurrency, right? So they're, they're already solving uh, that, that main hurdle we talked about earlier about how do you get someone using a currency, you need to pay them in that currency, right? But also if you're a Silicon Valley programmer, you're thinking about, oh, I want to build you know, an Internet of Things uh, payment system or application where there's some kind of payments uh, involved. What am I going to do today? I'm going to use a cryptocurrency because it's, it's available, it's open, it's programmable, has APIs has all these things that a digital pound uh, doesn't have, because there is no you know, really widely used programmable digital pound, right? So if machines started to use cryptocurrency, I think that's where you could see things really take off and, and, and something like Bitcoin or something that hasn't been invented yet actually become a more widely used cryptocurrency and payment system. So thank you very much uh, for your time and sorry for running over. Be happy to take questions at this point. women in the audience who want to ask the first question. I've been told this is, yes, the way we start things here at the Chatham House. Can you explain the difference between Ethereum and blockchain? Oh, sorry. Thank you so much. Can you explain the difference of blockchain and Ethereum? In Ethereum? Yes. Yes. I don't even know how to pronounce it. Yes. So Ethereum is a, you know, what some would argue a next generation kind of blockchain. Uh, it was invented after Bitcoin. Uh, it's the second largest uh, in terms of value uh, crypto asset. Uh, after Bitcoin, and it, it has capabilities that are different than Bitcoin. So, for example, it, it allows for much more uh, robust or, or, or kind of, uh, that's probably not the right word, much more complicated smart contracts. Um, we talked about earlier about how smart contracts, smart contracts can be used for flight insurance and so on. You can do richer, fuller smart contracts, program much more sophisticated smart contracts on Ethereum than you can on Bitcoin today because of its, you know, capabilities. Is it just faster or is it faster? It's faster, it's, it's designed differently. Um, it's uh, not as scarce as Bitcoin. So Bitcoin has a fixed supply of 21 million. Uh, there's only 17 million Bitcoins today, but it will hit a fixed supply of 21 million eventually. Ethereum, Ethereum supply may change, but it's designed to actually keep growing into perpetuity. So it's not as scarce. Some would argue that it's not as strong a store of value as, as Bitcoin for these reasons. Um, in fact, I mean, one interesting kind of observation you can make about kind of Bitcoin versus Ethereum is a lot of economics types tend to be more interested in Bitcoin because it, it makes more sense from a scarcity perspective. And a lot of engineers tend to be more excited about Ethereum because it has, uh, you know, more capabilities In the back there, yes. I guess it's, um, you can't really regulate the blockchain. It's more that you're regulating the uses of the blockchain, as it were. Um, could you talk a little bit about the different approaches and levels of acceptance and skepticism of this technology um, globally, China, Europe, mm. America, Latin America, etc. Yes. 
So, yeah, great question. There's been a real wide range of regulatory responses uh, to, to blockchain technology. Uh, in Switzerland, there's some places where you can actually pay some taxes in Bitcoin. I think the state of Arizona and the United States is, is thinking about this as well. Uh, countries like um, Bolivia, Ecuador have banned, made illegal uh, Bitcoin. China, you know, has cracked down, it seems, but it's very confusing what's going on in China. You know, I know, uh, you know, there's people in China that aren't allowed to leave the country who are involved <laughs> in the cryptocurrency industry right now. Um, so, you know, the common denominator, I think, across countries that have tended to crack down uh, is, is, you know, concerns around capital controls, uh, you know, and, and, and kind of money moving offshore uh, through cryptocurrency. Uh, in more open financial systems, we haven't seen uh, the kind of uh, crackdown like we've seen. But I would, I would push back a little bit on your comment that blockchain can't be regulated. I think there are certainly ways uh, to regulate uh, kind of the, the technology and, and the industry. Um, the technology may be de decentralized, right? And it, Bitcoin lives on thousands of computers in hundreds of countries, right? But people are still centralized. And so the Chinese have shown that, you know, they know where the exchange operators live and you know, where their offices are, you know, um, the Great Firewall of China can kind of disrupt traffic. Um, and, and then ultimately, you know, we could, you know, regulators could do things like ban uh, apps in the Apple and Google app stores, right? And, and most people aren't going to jailbreak their phones to, like, install a crypto app um, if that were to happen. So, yes, this gentleman here. Um, I've got a, a question linking, I mean, this is a little bit regulation, uh, but also when you get an, an issue like Venezuela, who've now mm. initiated a cryptocurrency to get around sanctions, um, how does the rest of the world deal with that? Mm. And, and what is the real value of whatever cryptocurrency they've invented? The claim being that it's based on the value of oil, but of course, less and less oil is coming out of the ground in Venezuela. So what, what, um, on what basis do you think yep. the West, well, particularly the US, might try and regulate that particular cryptocurrency? Right. So yeah, really interesting kind of development this year with the, the Petro. I wrote about uh, this and, and how you know, we, there's way more questions than answers right now about what's going to happen with the Petro. Um, you know, the U.S. has announced that, you know, it's illegal for uh, U.S. persons to engage with the Petro. That means U.S. exchanges can't list it. You know, people can't trade it. Um, you know, so I think there'll be an effort to try, try to minimize, you know, um, you know, amongst kind of the countries, you know, uh, you know, they're pressing sanctions against Venezuela. It's, it's growth, right? But um, how far will that go, I think, is a really interesting question. So, you know, initially the Petro uh, was going to be launched on the Ethereum platform. It, it moved to another one. Um, you know, I think Ethereum may have dodged a bullet here potentially because, uh, you know, if, if the U.S. wants to go far enough with this, they could start really, you know, kind of, you know, blacklisting Ethereum addresses and, and, and even actually putting pressure on the Ethereum Foundation to censor, you know, to organize kind of a, a, a censorship of of the Petro. And we haven't seen that happen yet, where governments have come in to blockchain projects and said, you need to reverse a transaction or um, censor in some way. But the Petro could potentially lead to that scenario. And that really draws attention to the fact that these blockchains are not immutable. They can be undone. The history can be reversed. In fact, we've already seen that with Ethereum with the, the famous DAO hack uh, in 2016. Uh, where they actually reversed that hack. Um, so, so, you know, that's a possibility that I think will be interesting to kind of see how that evolves uh, in this case. Uh, this gentleman here. Hello, my name is Ahmed, an alumni of Plan School of Economics. Uh, my question is, you mentioned that um, Bitcoin isn't a store of value or isn't money. So is there a case of what point does it become a full-fledged currency? So right now you mentioned that there's between 15 to 30 million users. So is it that after certain points, for example, 100 million, 200 million, it will become a full-fledged currency? 
I mean, I think people can argue about, you know, I, I think it is a currency today. Um, I just wouldn't put it, I wouldn't call it money in the same way I would call the U.S. dollar money um, because of this, you know, lack of serving as a unit of account. Um, when does it become money? When more things are priced in Bitcoin, I would say, when it's more widely used, more established. Um, you know, but it's something we could argue about, right? It's, I mean, there's no, like, clear black and white transition from, you know, kind of being a, you know, uh, you know, mostly a, you know, a store of value to a full-blown currency. Um, yep, this one right here. There's, okay, good. Uh, it's Masato one. Kimura, Japanese journalist. Uh, Hi. Uh, which do you think uh, single currency euro or uh, cryptocurrencies uh, survive longer? The euro or cryptocurrencies? <laughs> 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 oh boy. Um, so, I mean, you know, even if governments really crack down hard on Bitcoin, you know, will it ever go away completely? Probably not. Um, you know, it's, it, it could live on, you know, forever so long as, you know, the blockchain keeps functioning somewhere, someplace. It's actually being broadcast from outer space by satellites now. Um, so, you know, it's even you know, off our planet and functioning in the, in the, in, in, in space. Uh, so, you know, I mean, I would say that, you know, given the challenging situation in Europe, it might be a safer bet to think that Bitcoin might outlast Euro, the Euro, uh, you know, for that very reason, but it may not be very, very large, right? It could be just a few people using it, maintaining this thing. Um, there was a woman back there, yes. Um, one of the facts in your presentation which really surprised me and struck me was the 8 billion in ICOs versus almost 2 billion in VC investment. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd love it if you could help us understand that because the way, you know, one of the analogies that's often used for money is that it's like a language. The more people that use it, the more valuable it is. Mm -hmm. And it seems like ICOs, as far as I understand them, are kind of like tiny dialects, like incredibly specific. So why mm -hmm. is there so much money going into them? Right. Uh, good question. So. I think the short answer is is greed, <laughs> but there's there's you know new exciting technologies that are are being you know created around uh, blockchain and what ICOs have offered is an opportunity for the little guy so to speak to actually invest in early stage technology uh, for the first time really ever. Um, traditionally, if you want to invest in, in early stage technology, you had to be a venture capitalist or a wealthy individual, an accredited investor. Um, and so this has really opened up uh, access to seed stage technology. Uh, and, and of course, there's been incredible appreciation as well on many of these projects. And that's attracted a lot of you know, people looking to profit. Um, so it's a combination of things, right? It's a combination of a new funding channel that's opened up. Uh, it's a combination of exciting technology and then a lot of ex exuberance, I'd say. Yep. Um, I think someone here, yep, this, this gentleman here. Since this is a primer, I can ask a dumb question. Can you explain the mining process? I mean, where are the, where are the computer problems that people are, mine, are, are, are solving to mine the currency coming mm. from? Does it work in different ways according to different currencies? Can you explain that a little bit more? Yes, so I, I intentionally skipped this in the presentation because uh, <laughs> this, is, uh, this, is, this can be a longer, longer conversation. But, but basically, these computers that have downloaded the software and want to mine cryptocurrency, meaning validate, meaning validate transactions and play a role in supporting the network. They're in essence all competing against each other, all the other computers that have downloaded Bitcoin software to solve a cryptographic puzzle, all right? And the winner uh, of that, that race to solve that puzzle gets paid in new Bitcoins and gets the right to publish that block I showed you to append that next block to the blockchain, all right? Um, so that's the incentive for actually downloading the software and you know, uh, consuming the electricity and paying for that um, is you get paid in new Bitcoins and you get paid in transaction fees. So when I wanted to send Nick a Bitcoin, I wanted my transaction to Nick to go through faster than someone else's, so I paid a higher fee. And, and the miner that solves that puzzle is incentivized, incentivized to put my transaction in that bundle that's gonna be added to the chain ahead of someone else's who paid a lower fee. 
and the miner gets paid those fees as well. So those are the two kind of direct financial income streams that a miner can earn by running the software. Um, so yeah, they're, they're competing against each other to solve the puzzle, but they're also cooperating to maintain the net network. So there's this kind of interesting kind of... Is it useful to solve that puzzle? No. No, it's, it's useful in the sense that it, it's, not, it's, not, it's not accomplishing anything like, like it's a search for a, a new prime number. It's, not doing, it's, not, it's useful in the sense that it provides security for the Bitcoin network. So let, yeah, let me be clear on that. But it's not like, you know, oh, this competing power is going to help us find extraterrestrial life or you know, find new prime numbers. But it is providing a crucial uh, you know, kind of uh, layer in the security of the system. We got Coalition member of Chatham Mouse. Uh, how can we trust ICOs? Because their failure rate is really high, and there are lots of IC, uh, ICO ads are banned in Twitter, Facebook, and other platforms. Yeah. So how can we trust? How can we trust them, or how can we assess them? Yeah. So I, I'm not telling you to trust ICOs. Uh, <laughs> let me be clear here. Nor am I making any uh, investment recommendations. Uh, uh, no, I think you should be quite skeptical of many of these token sales. Uh, they're not widely regulated yet. Um, and really, you know, vaporware was being funded to the tune of tens of millions and still is hundreds of millions of, of dollars, right? Uh, simply a team with a white paper, sometimes, you know, not even. It was pure fraud, right, that's occurring with some of these ICOs. So, um, you know, if you're thinking about investing in an ICO, I, I strongly encourage you to do you know, serious diligence and be very skeptical uh, of the space. Is there any other women who want to ask questions here? Yeah. Oh, found this gentleman here. Yep. Yeah. Oh, with, uh, I'll wait for the well, microphone here. Whenever I go home and speak to with my uh, cypherpunk friends, they always insist Bitcoin <laughs> is the only currency. We only need Bitcoin. In the, in the long term, do you see room for multiple cyber as a currency? Do you see room for more than just Bitcoin, or is is Bitcoin where it's at? Right, so I, I don't have a, uh, a, like, this is the future and, and this is where it's going to go. I mean, you know, Bitcoin uh, used to be 90% of the market value of the entire cryptocurrency space. It's fallen to 30 40%. So it's already lost a lot, you know, some of its network uh, effect advantage, if you will. Um, has it lost enough to not win? I mean, Jack Dorsey doesn't think so. He thinks Bitcoin's going to triumph. Um, it's certainly the biggest still, has the most liquidity, you know, arguably the most developers, the most infrastructure support in terms of you know, uh, exchanges and wallets and so on. It's got the biggest brand. Uh, you know, it has some challenges too, right? And, and that, those are challenges are what have opened the door to uh, projects like Ethereum and others kind of taking market value share from Bitcoin. Uh, so it's not by any means, I think, um, clear that Bitcoin's you know, status as the number one currency is assured for all time, let alone that any of these cryptocurrencies will still be here uh, you know, even tomorrow. So I mean, the cryptography that underpins cryptocurrencies has never been mathematically proven to be secure. All right? it's, we only think it's secure because it hasn't been cracked. All right? But if, it, if it's ever cracked, you know, goodbye cryptocurrency, uh, at least until a solution can be introduced. Right? So, a lot of uncertainty around where this all could go. Is there, um, is that? I think we have to wrap okay. up at that point. Um, sorry, we will, uh, Gareth, uh, Gareth will, will join us uh, for the reception, so I'm sure he'll be able to answer some more questions if you didn't get your question asked, but we are a little bit over, so uh, we do need to wrap up. Thank you all for coming. Uh, you. We'll see you after the break. And before we go, please thank Gareth for a fantastic thank you. Thank you.